Thank you. Thank you, Johannes. Thank you, Al, for the invitation. Um, uh, so I'm talking about uh, a project that I just recently started. This was actually inspired by a, a talk of Lara Bossinger, who happens to be in the audience, um, and uh, is building on some work that I did with Jan Christofferson almost 10 years ago. Uh, and so, yeah, I'll be telling you that uh, type D isosahedra are unobstructed. Um, and so first, maybe I need to explain what I mean by type D isosahedra, and then I'll explain what I mean by unobstructed, and then I'll tell you why this is true. So uh, one of the uh, main gadgets that we're going to be looking at in the talk today are simplicial complexes and their associated Stanley Reisner rings. Uh, so let me begin by recalling what these are. Uh, so I'm always going to be using uh, script K uh, to denote a simplicial complex. Uh, and so a simplicial complex on some set of vertices V is just a collection of subsets of this vertex set, which is closed undertaking subsets. So over on the right, uh, I've pictorially uh, um, given you an example of a simplicial complex. So here my vertex set V consists of one, two, three, and four. I have these four blue vertices. Uh, and uh, then uh, there are some pairs of vertices that are in my simplicial complex. Uh, these are the pairs that are uh, joined by an edge. So for example, one, two is in my simplicial complex, but one, four is not. Uh, and then uh, I also have some triples of vertices that are in my simplicial complex, namely 2, 3, 4. Um, 1, 2, 3, for example, is not in the simplicial complex. Okay, so this is an example of a simplicial complex. And uh, the main reason that we're interested in this today is there's a very nice way of uh, translating this into an algebraic object. Uh, so I can create uh, what's called the Stanley Reisner ideal of my simplicial complex K. Uh, this is going to be an ideal in uh, the polynomial ring where I have one variable for each vertex in uh, my simplicial complex. And the ideal is going to be generated by certain square free monomials that we have here. Uh, namely, if I take any set of vertices uh, that uh, is not in the simplicial complex and I just take the product of the corresponding variables, uh, this will be uh, what generates my ideal. Uh, and of course, anytime I have an ideal in a ring, uh, I can take uh, the quotient, and this is what I'll be calling the Stanley Reisner ring of the simplicial complex. So here I'm just taking the quotient of the polynomial ring where the variables correspond to vertices by this Stanley Reisner ideal. Okay. Um, I should mention just some terminology. Uh, elements of my simplicial complex A, I'll be calling facets, uh, sorry, faces. Um, uh, the dimension of a face is just the number of vertices it contains, minus one. Uh, top dimensional faces will be facets. Uh, uh, zero dimensional faces will be vertices. One dimensional faces will be edges, et cetera. Okay. So just as an example, uh, this simplicial complex that we've uh, pictured over here, if I'm interested in what the corresponding Stanley Reisner ideal is, I've written it down here at the bottom. Uh, what I need to do is I need to look at the minimal non-faces of my simplicial complex. Uh, so one four, uh, as we see, is not a face. Uh, so this means that it will contribute to the ideal. And so I get this product x1, x4. Um, one, two, three, as I mentioned, is also not a face. And so I get this product x1, x2, x3. And in fact, these are the two minimal non-faces. And so they generate the Stanley Reisner ideal. Uh, so this is a, a nice way of producing some uh, algebraic object from uh, this combinatorial thing. And in fact, uh, there's a bijection between square free monomial ideals and simplicial complexes uh, induced by this construction. OK, uh, I'm mainly interested in algebraic geometry. Uh, and so now that we have a ring, uh, maybe what we want to do is we want to take proj of that ring. So we want to look at the projective variety that has the Stanley Reisner ring of K as its homogeneous coordinate ring. And uh, the geometry of this scheme is reflected very nicely in the geometry of the simplicial complex K that I started with. Uh, so for example, uh, irreducible components of this scheme P of K correspond to maximal faces of the simplicial complex. Um, 
if the simplicial complex K that I begin with is a sphere, so if its topological realization is a sphere, then uh, P of K is Calabiao in the sense that uh, the dualizing sheaf on P of K is, is trivial. Uh, and uh, this last point uh, is something that uh, I especially like because I'm interested in toric varieties. Uh, so I'm not going to explain very much about toric varieties in this talk. All you need to know is that uh, if you have some lattice polytope P, uh, there is an associated uh, projective toric variety uh, XP. Uh, and so what's this last point is saying is that if I have some lattice polytope uh, together with, uh, which admits a regular unimodular triangulation um, of the form K, so of the form of this simplicial complex K, then the toric variety that's associated to P uh, has a flat degeneration to the Stanley Reisner scheme, PK. Okay, so um, this is uh, maybe a, a nice way to understand some degenerations of toric varieties. So I want to actually give uh, just a, a quick example of uh, such a degeneration. Uh, so here on the left, uh, I have a, a two dimensional lattice polytope. Uh, it has uh, this triangle with uh, these three vertices, one, two, and three, and there is another interior lattice point. Uh, the way that I get a toric variety from this uh, is, well, I take uh, the ring that uh, has variables corresponding to the lattice points of this polytope, and then I look at equations that are coming from the affine relations among these lattice points. So in this case, uh, the sum of the lattice points one, two, and three is equal to three times uh, the zeroth lattice point. Uh, and so this actually then gets translated into the binomial relation x1, x2, x3 is equal to x naught cubed, which another way of writing that is just this guy here. And so this is a toric variety associated to this lattice polytope. On the right hand side, uh, I now have a simplicial complex uh, that consists of uh, three uh, two-dimensional simplices and then all their faces. Uh, and if you write down the Stanley Reisman ideal for this, uh, it turns out just to be x1, x2, x3, uh, because the only, um, yeah, the, uh, uh, one, two, three is the minimal non-face here. Um, and uh, there is indeed a flat degeneration from uh, the variety on the left to the scheme on the right. And it's actually just coming by taking a Grobner degeneration that's focusing on x1, x2, x3 here as the initial term. Uh, so this is a, a nice example of a degeneration um, illustrating this third point that I was making. Okay, uh, maybe just pause and see if there are questions now. Nobody's raising their hand, so uh, let me continue. Um, so this is sort of the underlying uh, translation between uh, combinatorics and algebra and geometry that we're going to be using in this talk. Uh, there's a very special simplicial complex that we're going to be talking about, um, namely the, uh, the type uh, DN associohedron. But first I'd like to talk about the classical associohedron. This is um, going to be some maybe a little easier and, and some good motivation uh, for what's coming later. Uh, so this is a very um, special simplicial complex that I'm going to be talking about. I'm calling it script AN. Uh, and so technically this is going to be uh, the boundary complex of the polar dual of the associohedron polytope. So the associohedron is some polytope that was introduced by uh, Jim Stashoff uh, in the study of algebraic topology actually. Uh, when he introduced it, he didn't know that it was a polytope yet, um, uh, but it's since been shown that it is one. Um, and so you can take this polytope, take its dual, and then take the boundary complex of that. It turns out to be a simplicial complex, and I'm going to give you a very concrete description of what this simplicial complex is. So uh, for this simplicial complex, we're starting with a regular n-gon. This is what I've drawn up in the uh, upper right-hand corner of this slide. Uh, and the simplicial complex that I'm interested in, its vertex set is going to consist of diagonals uh, delta ij from the ith vertex to the jth vertex of this n-gon. Um, so uh, i and j need to differ by more than one, otherwise that doesn't count as a diagonal. It needs to actually pass through the interior 
of this n gon. Um, uh, so these are this is what the vertex set uh, for my associohedron is, uh, or, or for this complex a n. And the faces will consist of sets of diagonals that do not cross. Okay, so let's look at an example of this. Uh, here we're going to take n to be equal to five. Uh, and so uh, I have a five gon uh, that I've drawn, and I've drawn five different diagonals of this five gon. These are all the diagonals. Uh, and so these are this is the vertex set for this simplicial complex A5. And uh, the faces now will consist of collections of these diagonals that do not cross. So for example, uh, uh, this diagonal that I just put a dot next to, uh, this does not cross uh, this diagonal up here at the top. And so together, uh, they form a edge of my simplicial complex A5. And this is now represented by me uh, drawing in this edge between the two. And so I've drawn in a bunch of other edges. Uh, so there's many pairs of these diagonals that are non-crossing. They all form edges of the simplicial complex. Um, however, there are some uh, pairs of diagonals that do cross, and so there's no edge between them. Furthermore, if I take any triple of diagonals, they necessarily cross. Uh, so uh, the only simplices in this simplicial complex are the vertices and the edges that I've drawn. Okay, so uh, this is a very strange coincidence that uh, the uh, simplicial complex A5, which is somehow coming from a 5-gon, itself looks like a 5-gon. This is normally not the case. Uh, it, what is actually the case is that this complex An in general, uh, it will be topologically a sphere, uh, but its dimension is going to be equal to n minus 4. So it just happened in, in, in the case n equals 5 that the dimension was 1. Um, as we increase n, the dimension increases. Okay, so let me maybe mention that uh, a nice thing about this being a sphere, as I mentioned on the previous slide, is that if I look at the associated Stanley Reisner scheme, um, that that will be something which is Calabial. Okay, so this is uh, uh, this simplicial complex AN, the uh, boundary complex of the dual associohedron. And uh, one nice thing about this, besides being a sphere, is that there is a, uh, a degeneration of the Grassmannian G2N to a cone over this Stanley Reisner scheme. Uh, so this was uh, is an old result from Sturmfels, uh, and uh, right, so I mentioned that uh, the Stanley Reisner scheme P A N uh, this is Calabial. Uh, when I take a cone over it, uh, this cone becomes something which is Fano, which is maybe what we expect because the Grassmannian itself is also Fano. Okay, so there's this nice degeneration of the Grassmannian to P A N. All right. So this is the classical associohedron. Uh, and uh, what I'd like to talk about next, so eventually we're going to get to type dn associohedra, but uh, I'd like to uh, first talk about unobstructedness. So this is a notion that's coming from deformation theory. Uh, if I have uh, some k algebra s, here k is just a field, uh, there are uh, these cotangent cohomology modules that are related to deformation theory. So there's this module T2 of S. Uh, this is what's called the second cotangent cohomology. And this uh, is a module that measures obstructions to deforming uh, the K algebra S. Or if you want to think geometrically, it's measuring obstructions to deforming uh, spec S. Uh, in particular, uh, if uh, this module is equal to zero, uh, there is no obstructions, and spec S has a smooth versal deformation. Um, if you want to think about things, uh, maybe projective schemes instead, if you start with a graded uh, K-algebra S, and there are some other hypotheses that are satisfied, well, first of all, anytime you have a graded K-algebra, this cotangent cohomology is going to inherit uh, a grading as well. And so you can look at the degree zero piece. And it turns out that if the degree zero piece is equal to zero, then uh, this scheme proj S 
is a smooth point in its Hilbert scheme. So what I mean by that is the following. Uh, proj S is a projective scheme. It has some Hilbert polynomial. I can look at uh, the Hilbert scheme that's parametrizing all schemes with this fixed Hilbert polynomial. Uh, proj S is certainly one of them, so it corresponds to a point in this parameter space. And this condition on the second cotangent cohomology guarantees that this is actually a smooth point in this Hilbert scheme. So this is something that uh, certainly many people are interested in, finding smooth points in Hilbert schemes, and maybe more generally just studying the structure of Hilbert schemes. OK, so uh, this brings me to my old result with Jan Christofferson. So this is from 2011. Uh, we show that the, the simplicial complex AN, so this boundary complex uh, of the dual associohedron, is unobstructed. In other words, uh, what I mean by unobstructed is that uh, the second cotangent cohomology of the Stanley Reisner ring of the simplicial complex is equal to zero. Okay? So anytime I say that some simplicial complex is unobstructed, what I actually mean is that this second cotangent cohomology module for the associated Stanley Reisner ring is equal to zero. Okay? So this is the unobstructedness result. Um, now, uh, here's the reason that we were interested in this back then. So back then, we were trying to find uh, as many degenerations uh, of this Grassmannian G2N to toric varieties as we could. Okay, And so uh, if you sort of put together this unobstructedness with some of the other things I told you, you get uh, the following corollary. So let's say that we have some lattice polytope P that has a regular unimodular triangulation of uh, a particular form. Namely, uh, the triangulation is a, a simplicial complex that I get by taking the join of this dual associohedron, AN, with uh, an N minus one dimensional simplex. So this, this star, uh, this is an operation that you can do to simplicial complexes. This is what's called the join. I'll actually define what this is later in the talk. But for the moment, just think this is some simplicial complex that's related to this dual associohedron. So assuming that we have a polytope like this, then uh, the Grassmannian G2N and the torque variety corresponding to this lattice polytope lie on the same component of the Hilbert scheme. Okay, so uh, we're sort of seeing a picture of this here in the bottom right. Uh, I have some component of the Hilbert scheme. I have a point here that's corresponding to this torque variety, a point here that's corresponding to my Grassmannian. And the reason that we know that they both lie on the same component of the Hilbert scheme is because I've told you actually that both of them uh, already have uh, flat degenerations to this Stanley Reisner scheme here. So this is also something in my Hilbert scheme. And uh, by this unobstructedness result of Jan and myself, we know that this point of the Hilbert scheme, this is a smooth point. In particular, it only lies on a single component. Uh, and so anything degenerating to it also has to lie on the same component of the Hilbert scheme. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the corollary. And this is the application that we were interested in at that time. OK, uh, so maybe let me just briefly pause again and see if there are any, any questions that have come up. No, nope, doesn't seem like. Yeah, OK, excellent. So um, this is the story from almost 10 years ago. And uh, I should say that back then, uh, Jan and I were very interested in this idea of unobstructed simplicial complexes and sort of had maybe just generally the question uh, for what k, so for what simplicial complex is k, is t2 of sk equal to 0. And there's some kind of criterion for checking this that uh, I will uh, be telling you about in a bit, but it's in general not so transparent. And what we really were looking for was sort of families of interesting simplicial complexes that are unobstructed. Uh, and so uh, this family coming from the associohedron is one of them. And uh, it turns out, of course, there are many generalizations of the classical associohedron. Uh, there are associohedrons that are sort of talking about um, k-crossing triangular uh, or 
collections of K-crossing diagonals. Um, there are associahedra for other um, other root systems. And so we looked at a couple of these and, and really couldn't find anything that seemed unobstructed. Um, but actually, uh, we missed one of them. And that's what the rest of this talk is about. Uh, so uh, one generalization of the classical associahedron is to uh, what are called type D associahedra. Uh, so let me tell you about uh, another simplicial complex. Uh, so the simplicial complex here uh, will denote by script Dn. Uh, and so uh, one way of thinking about this is as being the cluster complex for type Dn cluster algebras. So this is something that was introduced by Fulman and Zelovinsky. Um, and another way of actually thinking about this is there is uh, a, a polytope called the type Dn associahedron, uh, which is again related to cluster algebras. And if you take uh, the polar dual of this and the boundary complex, this is exactly this simplicial complex Dn. Uh, so uh, you can do this for any root system you want. Uh, the classical associahedron that I talked about uh, on several slides ago, uh, this was in fact uh, actually just the cluster complex for type A and cluster algebras. You can do the same thing for type uh, B and C and also the exceptional types, et cetera. Uh, and maybe one reason that we uh, didn't think about what happened in type DN uh, nine years ago was because I began looking at the uh, type uh, B associahedra and saw that they were not unobstructed. Uh, and so that sort of uh, disheartened me and I didn't bother to look at type DN. Uh, okay, so I, I wanna give you a concrete description of what this simplicial complex is though. And so this is again related to, tri to triangulations, but now we're not thinking about triangulations of the n-gon. Instead, we're thinking about triangulations of a 2-n-gon. So I've drawn a picture of a 2-n-gon down at the bottom right. And vertices of my simplicial complex, dn, uh, these are going to, again, correspond to diagonals in some sense of this 2-n-gon. But now there's a bit of a twist. So there's two types of uh, vertices of my simplicial complex, dn. Uh, the first uh, kind of vertex uh, will be a, a symmetric pair of non-diameter diagonals of the 2 n gon. So we see a picture of this, uh, these two gray lines down on the right. Uh, so uh, being a non-diameter diagonal means that I'm not one of the long diagonals of this 2 n gon. So I'm not going from vertex i to vertex i plus n. That's one of the long diagonals. Um, and uh, yeah, I wanna be symmetric with respect to the origin. So if I have the diagonal delta ij, then I also need to have the diagonal delta i, I plus n, j plus n. Uh, here, of course, all the indices are taken uh, modulo 2n. Okay, so this is the first kind of vertex uh, for this simplicial complex dn. Uh, the second kind of vertex, uh, these are coming from the long diagonals, from the diameters of the 2n gon, um, but each uh, diameter will actually contribute two vertices. One I will call the red diameter and the other I will call the blue diameter. So we see um, two of these vertices pictured below as well. Okay, so these are the vertices of the simplicial complex. Now we want to know what the faces of the simplicial complex are. And so again, faces are going to be given by collections of non-crossing diagonals. Uh, but the rules for when diagonals don't cross are a little bit tricky. So certainly, uh, anytime you think that you have a collection of diagonals that is not crossing, it is not crossing. But there are also some other uh, special rules that uh, tell you that other diagonals don't cross either. So if I have di diameters of the same color, they do not cross. So this pair of blue diameters that we're seeing now, even though it looks like it crosses, this doesn't count as crossing. Uh, and uh, also, if I have uh, the red and blue diameter uh, from uh, uh, along the same uh, the same one, uh, this also counts as not crossing. Okay, so these are the rules for uh, what it means to not cross. Um, here in the bottom right, now I've pictured a collection of non-crossing diagonals. Uh, so this 
uh, represents a simplex um, with four vertices in my simplicial complex. I have these two long diameters, and then I have two further pairs of non-diameter diagonals. And indeed, uh, this is a non-crossing set of diagonals. Okay, so um, in general, this simplicial complex Dn is going to be an n minus one dimensional sphere. Uh, you can see on the right, uh, what we're actually looking at is this special case uh, when n is equal to four. And uh, this collection of uh, diagonals that I've depicted here is actually a maximal uh, set of non-crossing diagonals. Uh, and there's exactly four of them, uh, which means that we would have a three-dimensional simplicial complex, which agrees with this n minus one that we're seeing right here. Okay. So this is uh, the type, uh, uh, this very concrete uh, description for the cluster complex of um, type DN cluster algebras. And yeah, again, this goes back to this work of Fulman and Zelovinsky. Okay. Uh, so you might guess uh, what the next slide is and the main result of this talk, uh, namely uh, the simplicial complex coming from uh, this uh, type DN associohedron. Uh, this is also unobstructed. Okay, that is uh, the second cotangent cohomology of the associated Stanley Reisner ring is equal to zero. Okay. So this is the main result. Uh, what I'd like to do in the rest of the talk is uh, give you an idea of why this is true. So sort of sketch the proof of, of this result. And then at the very end, maybe just uh, mention some ideas of, for application. So let's talk a little bit about cotangent cohomology for Stanley Reisner rings in general. So here I'm going to take S to be the Stanley Reisner ring of some uh, simplicial complex K. Now, uh, my Stanley Reisner ring S uh, comes with a natural grading by Z to the number of vertices. Uh, each variable, uh, I can just give um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the weight um, associated to uh, the basis vector of z to the v uh, coming from the corresponding vertex. Uh, and uh, this uh, makes my Stanley Reisner ring um, sk, uh, z to the v graded. And uh, this grading then um, induces a grading on uh, cotangent cohomology as well. So on a previous slide, I, I just mentioned second cotangent cohomology. Of course, um, there's much more than that. For any i, I can look at the ith cotangent cohomology module. This is actually a nice delta functor. Um, the cotangent cohomology that's most interesting for deformation theory is um, the first and second cotangent cohomology. First cotangent cohomology is describing the first order deformations, and then the second cotangent cohomology is describing the obstructions. Uh, and uh, there's some work by Kaus Saltman and Jan Christofferson from 2000 that uh, give a very nice description of the first and second cotangent cohomology modules for Stanley Reisner rings uh, in terms of uh, relative simplicial cohomology coming from simplicial complexes that are related to the original simplicial complex K. Okay, so there's some sort of combinatorial way of accessing this. Um, although in general, it's still rather complicated and uh, in particular is not immediately clear when the second cotangent cohomology is equal to zero. Now, we're in a very special situation when we're considering K to be either the type AN or the type DN uh, associohedron. Uh, these are special kinds of simplicial complexes that are called flag complexes. So what's a flag complex? Some simplicial complex is a flag complex if and only if uh, the minimal non-faces have at most two vertices. Uh, so another way of saying this is that the Stanley Reisner ideal of the simplicial complex uh, is generated by um, variables and quadrics. Okay, so this is a special kind of simplicial complex and uh, both AN and DN are flag complexes. Why is this the case? So what's a non-face of AN or DN? In both cases, it's going to be some set 
of uh, diagonals that are not non-crossing. So what does that mean? That means that I have to have a pair of diagonals that do cross. Uh, and so uh, whatever face I had, I'm sorry, whatever non-face I had, um, this is going to contain the non-face uh, that just involves these two crossing diagonals. Uh, and so that means that I have uh, something that's a flat complex. Okay, uh, why do we care about this? Well, it turns out that for flag complexes, uh, there's a nice uh, sufficient criterion for guaranteeing unobstructedness. Uh, so this uh, was uh, is to be found in my work with Jan from, from nine years ago. So if you have some flag complex K, it's unobstructed if three criteria hold. Uh, first of all, the topological realization of the simplicial complex is a sphere. Uh, and okay, that's nice. We actually already know that this is okay uh, for K equals A N or D N. Right? We already knew that these were spheres, so that's nice. Uh, we have two more criteria. So the second criteria uh, that needs to be fulfilled is that we want uh, for any link K prime of my simplicial complex, uh, the second cotangent cohomology of the Stanley Reisner ring for the link is equal to zero. This prime is actually in the wrong spot, it should be right here, sorry. Uh, so this is saying something about uh, cotangent cohomology vanishing for certain smaller simplicial complexes. Uh, I'm going to explain on the next slide what the link is, so, so we'll get to that. Um, uh, this is the second criterion that we need fulfilled. The third uh, is saying that uh, some other simplicial complex LB, I'll also explain what this is, this is actually contractible. Um, and so we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so the, to get unobstructedness, it's sufficient to show that these three criteria hold. The first one is taken care of, um, and we'll talk about two and three in the following discussion. And so let's begin now by talking about links. Uh, I'm also going to talk about this other operation uh, on some palatial complexes, joins, because this is actually going to be important for us to describe what the links of uh, these particular simplicial complexes are. Okay, so what's uh, what's a link? So uh, I take some simplicial complex K, and I take a face F of my simplicial complex. And uh, we can define the link of F and K to consist of all those sets G, uh, which are uh, in the complement of uh, F, uh, such that the union of G and F is, again, a face of K. Okay, so that's maybe a, a bit much to parse all at once. Let's just do this in an example. So uh, here on the right, I've pictured a simplicial complex. Uh, this is, I guess, a two-dimensional simplicial complex. There's uh, three um, two-dimensional faces and a bunch of other stuff. And I'm going to take F, whoops, uh, F to be this uh, blue vertex. And so we're interested in what the link of this is in my simplicial complex. Okay, and so it turns out to be exactly uh, this red bit that I've drawn. Let's maybe think about the vertices for a second. So if I take uh, this vertex that I just circled, uh, if I take its union with the blue vertex, that gives me this edge, which certainly is in the simplicial complex. And so that vertex will indeed be uh, an element of uh, the link. Uh, in general, um, the vertices of the link will be exactly those vertices of my simplicial complex uh, that uh, are forming an edge with this blue vertex. So I get exactly these four things here. And then I also get, um, say, this edge up at the top uh, because uh, that edge together with the blue thing forms this shaded two simplex. Okay, so this is an example of a link. And so this is, yeah, this is the notion of a link. Um, this other notion that I wanted to describe was the, the notion of a join. So let's say that I have uh, two simplicial complexes, K and K prime, um, disjoint sets of vertices. Okay, so to get the join, I'm just looking at uh, the set of all simplices of the form F disjoint union F prime 
where f is in k and f prime is in k prime. Okay, so as an example, uh, let's say that uh, this boundary of a triangle is my k, and these uh, just two disjoint points is my simplicial complex k prime. The resulting simplicial complex that I get will be this bipyramid over a triangle that I pictured down here. Uh, as an example in, in here, we could take, for example, the face uh, uh, of k given by the blue and black vertices uh, and the face of k prime given by this green vertex. Uh, the corresponding face that I'm getting in the join is going to be this facet sort of on the top left of my um, on the top left of this bipyramid. Okay, so this is what the join of two simplicial complexes is. Um, algebraically, uh, the Stanley Reisner ring of the join of two simplicial complexes is just the tensor product of the uh, two original Stanley Reisner rings. And so this will be important in the next slide. Okay, so now we know what links are, and uh, we had this criterion on the previous slide that somehow involved links for my simplicial complex, checking that they're unobstructed. And so we're interested in knowing what the links of this simplicial complex dn look like. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, this is a concrete example right now where n is equal to 8 in this picture. Um, but in general, uh, let's suppose that I have some face of my simplicial complex dn. I'm interested in understanding the link, right? So I want link of f dn. This is what I'd like to understand. And um, the first thing to notice is this face is actually introducing some partial triangulation, so some subdivision of the 2n gon. Right? My face f consisted of some set of non-crossing diagonals. And if I draw them all in, I get some kind of subdivision of the 2n gon. Now, uh, and, and so an example of this in the case when n, n equals 8 is what I've just drawn right here. Now, what is going to be in the link? So the link uh, will consist of sets of diagonals such that I can add them to this existing set of diagonals and remain non-crossing. Okay. Uh, now, to be non-crossing, uh, uh, I can maybe, let's focus on this region over here on the left uh, where I've written A5. Uh, how can I put in extra diagonals here that will be non-crossing? Well, they're not allowed to cross this gray diagonal that I'm about to highlight in red. Right? In other words, I'm looking at ways to further subdivide this 5-gon that I have on the left. Of course, uh, vertices of dn, uh, well, one kind of vertex corresponds to symmetric pairs of diagonals. So anytime I put in some uh, additional diagonal here on the left, uh, I'm also going to be putting in its mirror pair over here on the right. Okay, And while uh, both of these things, these are just five gons, ways that I can put in non-crossing diagonals here uh, are parameterized exactly by the uh, simplicial complex A5. Okay, uh, The same thing goes uh, maybe here in this region. If I want to figure out how I can add in diagonals here, uh, well, this is a three gon. I can't add any more in, but uh, I could think about this as being an A3. Here on the bottom, this would be an A4. Um, I also have this central region, D2. This is the only place in this picture um, where I can possibly put in long diagonals, so the diameters, that might not cross anything. Right? I can maybe put in, uh, say, this uh, diagonal here. And uh, ways of doing this, uh, well, this is a foregone, so ways of doing this are parameterized by D2. Okay, and now the point is um, that each of these regions is essentially independent from the others. Um, well, of the red and the blue ones, the, the green ones, anytime I put something in a 
the blue one I need to put it uh, in, in the green one as well. Uh, and so what this means is that uh, the link is actually just going to be the join of uh, all these simplicial complexes. So in this example, uh, the link would be exactly the join of A3 with A4 with A5 with D2. Okay, so this is uh, one example. Uh, here's another situation that could happen. It could be that my face F uh, already contains uh, this blue diameter in the middle. Okay, and so now I've sort of subdivided this um, symmetric region in the middle, and uh, I can no longer put in any um, any more red diameters except for the one uh, that lines up with this blue one. And so what actually ends up happening in this situation is in, in the middle area, the further um, uh, further diagonals that I can put in uh, are going to be parameterized by an A4. Uh, the reason for this is, well, I now have a foregon. I'm going to mark these vertices red, uh, where I've sort of added this vertex here in the middle. Uh, and the additional blue diameters that I could put in would maybe correspond to um, uh, things that are coming from this, this vertex in the center. Uh, and the uh, edge that I could put in joining this top left and bottom right vertex, this is um, this is exactly the red diameter that I would have between these two things. Okay, so in this case, instead of having a join with some um, type D and associohedron, I just have a join of a bunch of type A and associohedron. In general, uh, the link of some face F in this uh, D and associohedron is always going to be a join of at most one uh, type D and associohedron with a bunch of type A and associohedron. Okay, and it's exactly coming from uh, this, this subdivision picture that we looked at. And an important thing to notice is that these indices Ni, these will always be, uh, say, strictly less than uh, the N that I started with. Okay, now if you remember from two slides ago, what am I trying to show? I'm trying to show that uh, T2 of the link is equal to zero. Uh, this is what I'd like to do. Uh, now, uh, this link we've written as the join of a bunch of simplicial complexes, which means that the Stanley Reisner ring is going to be a tensor product of a bunch of Stanley Reisner rings for smaller simplicial complexes. There is a, a nice uh, tool in cotangent cohomology called the zariski jacobi sequence that tells you that um, if you have two rings that have vanishing T2, then their tensor product also has vanishing T2. Uh, and so this means then uh, that uh, if you knew that the, uh, each of these simplicial complexes were, was unobstructed, this tells you that the link is also unobstructed. Uh, and so then you can proceed by induction, right? If you uh, assume that uh, T, uh, um, dm is, uh, 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 is unobstructed for m less than n, and we already know that all the an are unobstructed, um, then this tells you that uh, any link of dn is also unobstructed. Okay. So this is, uh, this is how one goes about showing this criterion two, that the links are unobstructed. And so this just leaves us with the final criterion, criteria three. Uh, so uh, we needed to check here that some simplicial complex LB was contractible. Let me tell you what the simplicial complex LB is. So here B is going to be some pair of vertices, V comma W, which is not an edge in my simplicial complex. Okay. Uh, and what is LB? Uh, this is just going to be the intersection of the link of V with the link of W. In other words, I'm looking at uh, collections of vertices uh, such that this collection of vertices together with V is in DN and this collection of vertices together with W is DN. 
In other words, I'm looking at uh, collections of non-crossing diagonals uh, that cross neither V nor W. Okay. So uh, there's a bunch of different cases to consider uh, depending on what B is, right? So B is always going to be some pair of crossing diagonals. There's a bunch of different ways that diagonals uh, can cross. One way that uh, we're going to look at here is if I have uh, some red diameter and some blue diameter that are not the same, right? Then they do cross and we see this in this picture below. So here I have the blue diameter delta i n plus i, and the red diameter delta j n plus j. And uh, uh, right, so these are crossing. Uh, and uh, the point is, if I take any set of non-crossing diagonals that crosses neither the red one nor the blue one, then this set of diagonals also cannot cross the diagonal delta i j from i to j. Uh, right. If I had something that was crossing delta ij, uh, well, it has to maybe start down in this region somewhere down here. Uh, but to reach another vertex, it's going to have to pass either through the red thing or the blue thing. Okay. So what this is telling us is, well, anything that's crossing delta ij, it's crossing either this blue or the red thing. Uh, and so uh, this pair, this symmetric pair of diagonals, um, delta ij, delta i plus n, j plus n, this is in every face of the simplicial complex LB. Okay. In other words, LB is a cone, uh, which tells us that it's contractible. Okay, so this was just one of the cases that can occur. Uh, there are other ways to have a pair of crossing diagonals. You can do a similar analysis for, in the other cases and see that each one of these sets LB that you can get is either just empty or it's uh, uh, something which is contractible. And so this then, um, uh, this then satisfies criterion three and lets us conclude that uh, this simplicial complex DN is unobstructed. Okay, so this is uh, the sketch of the proof of this result. And it's exactly uh, the same proof uh, as in the type AN case, just that the combinatorics involved is slightly different because you're looking at these slightly uh, trickier um, kinds of triangulations. OK, so I'd like to just conclude by maybe talking about some applications of this. Uh, so uh, the first application is that, well, since we know that uh, DN is unobstructed, uh, if I look at the associated Stanley Reisner scheme, um, it will be a smooth point of its Hilbert scheme. And so if you're interested in finding smooth points of Hilbert schemes, now I've just given you a, a whole uh, interesting family of them. So this is maybe the first application. Uh, the second application, uh, uh, this is maybe a better way of saying this, this is an application in progress. Uh, this is coming from toric degenerations. Uh, and so this actually brings me back to, to where I even uh, got the idea to look at unobstructedness for these DN isosahedra. So I recently heard a talk by Laura Bossinger, who's, I believe, in the audience. Um, and uh, among other things, uh, she was talking about how there's a very nice degeneration of the Grassmannian G36 to a cone over this Stanley Reisner scheme, um, P of D4. OK, now we know that um, P of D4 is uh, unobstructed, so is any cone over it. Uh, and so uh, if I'm interested in finding a toric degeneration of G36, um, all I need to do is find some polytope uh, that has a regular unimodular triangulation of the form D4 joined with some simplex. Uh, and so this is similar to the situation of G2N. This lets you find uh, toric degenerations of G34. Uh, so this is uh, somehow for this uh, special case of uh, D4. Uh, what about um, uh, type DN associahedra for N larger than four? Um, well, there's work by Sir Yanko, Sherman Bennett, and Lauren Williams. Uh, rather recently, they show that uh, certain Schubert varieties or skew Schubert varieties um, can get be the, the coordinate rings of these can be given the structure of type DN cluster algebras. Uh, and so there's um, good reason to believe 
uh, that this uh, means that these varieties also have degenerations to cones over the associated Stanley Reisner ring. Uh, this hasn't been proven yet. I know that Laura is thinking about it. That's why there is uh, still very much a question mark here. But if that turns out to be the case, then you similarly would be able to find um, toric degenerations of these varieties using similar techniques. Okay, so that's all I have for your applications for now. Uh, thanks a lot for listening.